Hi there, I bought this old Solatron power supply from eBay for parts or not working because I was impressed by the specs. I should explain that I always try to find and study the service manual before bidding on an old piece of electronics. This is the first test of this power supply. I'm using my light bulb mains current limiter I described in a previous video to prevent any possible damage in case something goes horribly wrong, which is always an option in such eBay finds. The digital meter is measuring the output voltage. When turning on, the 100 watt light bulb lights up but not on full brightness, which is a good sign. However, the output voltage is negative and increasing. No response to the controls either. Something is definitely wrong. Upon opening, a problem is quite obvious. One leg of that red electrolytic capacitor has broken off. Is it really that easy? A closer view of the problem. The capacitor is labeled C1 on the PCB and marked 500 microfarads 25 volts. The positive leg has snapped off when it enters the capacitor body. A quick inspection of the rest. This thing is built like a tank and very heavy, 7.9 kilos according to the manual. There's an enormous blue capacitor with screw terminals under the transformer, one of the biggest I've ever come across so far. A large red heatsink and a horizontal meter. The other side has a PCB with a problem cap and you can see the other end of the big blue capacitor. Yes, it spans the whole width of this unit. On the left is one of the thumb switches for the volt setting. To get to the PCB I removed the two screws holding the upper bar. I already did the rear one earlier. The whole thing is supposed to just flip out, but it doesn't because the black tray which forms part of the enclosure blocks it, so that has to be removed first. With that removed, the PCB flips out as it's supposed to. I must say this is very nicely designed. The PCB reveals several other electrolytic capacitors, some looking quite suspicious. Here's the PCB in all its glory. Those golden caps are very suspicious. Although they don't look as if they have leaked, they are certainly coated in something very sticky. And that slanted cap on the right looks like a dodgy repair. But a check with the manual shows that this arrangement is indeed original. Given the age and the stickiness of some of the caps, I decided to replace all electrolytic caps. Note that I left the leg of C1 in the board. That's because there's some wires soldered to it on the underside, which I did not want to disturb. I will simply solder the replacement to the leg. These are the caps from that part of the PCB. As I mentioned, the golden ones are extremely sticky and disgusting to touch. The replacement caps. The blue one is a 470 microfarad cap, which is slightly less than the 500 of the original, but I don't think it matters. The same is true for the one that is mounted in parallel with it. It's smaller because it needs only a 16 volt rating. The sticky 100 microfarad cap is replaced with a new 100 microfarad cap of the same voltage rating. Between the big yellow cap and the transformer was originally another one of those sticky caps and it too has been replaced with a new 100 microfarad cap. The slanted sticky cap has been replaced with a standing cap. I have lots of those, but very few axial caps. In this case, the unused holes and tracks made it possible to simply put one of those in. I did have to put one jump wire underneath, but completely forgot to film it, sorry. The other cap you see is not electrolytic and still fine. Before doing any more, I decided to run another test. And yes, replacing the electrolytics on the PCB has done the trick. The output is now positive and it follows the 10 volt thumb switch. But there are more electrolytic caps. Here is one directly across the output terminals. That should go as well. And really, 100 microfarad rated for 60 volts across an output that can be set to 59.9 volts. They were really cutting it close. And it's from May 1965. Wow. The new 100 microfarad cap is rated for 100 volts, but much smaller, so I put an O-ring into the clamp to hold it in place and solder it in. There is, of course, still the big monster. And if you look carefully, there's another small cap next to it. 
Removing the big cap needs a screwdriver instead of a soldering iron and quite a bit of push and pull to get it out from the tight clamps that hold it in place. It's a 2800 microvolt cap rated for 100 volts. The cap itself is in an insulating plastic sleeve that has developed a split. I am not sure if that happened when I removed it or earlier. While the big one is out, I decided to replace the one remaining original electrolytic cap because it's really hard to get to. And it turned out to be another of the 100 microfarad 60 volt caps from 1965, which I replaced with a 100 microfarad 100 volt type. I spent quite some time thinking about how to replace the big capacitor with the least mods of the power supply. Even modern caps such as this 3300 microfarad 100 volt rated one are big and need some sort of mounting. A lucky find of some old PCB pipe that nearly had the same diameter as the old cap settled it. I'm building a replacement cap that fits the original mounting brackets. I cut out an opening in the pipe and made a wooden end cap. The front cap is made of two layers of clear plastic which I'm gluing together. The idea is that the new capacitor will be mounted in the pipe secured by cable ties but will be easily accessible through the cutout. And here's the result. Not pretty, but functional. I epoxied two M4 machine screws into the front plate so the original connections can still be used. The screws are connected to the new cap inside. Testing my new cap by ramping the output up in steps of 10 volts to 50 volts. More about that later. Everything's working just fine. Here's a close up of the front of my new capacitor and the back. With everything fixed, a quick explanation of what this thing actually is and why I thought it might be worth buying and repairing. Solatron made a few variants of this power supply and the model I have is the AS1414.2 0 to 60 volts, 0 to 1 amp. Voltage is set for three thumb wheels with 100 millivolt resolution, but there is a port for fine adjustment. Current limit is set by rotary switches in step of 100 milliamps. For finer adjustment of the current, there is a variant that I have where there is a port for continuous adjustment and one shown in this picture with another rotary switch giving fixed steps of 10 milliamps. Apart from this, the variants are identical. Features include voltage sensing, way of programming the voltage or current remotely and mode indication and alarm. Mode being constant voltage or constant current. Finally, the output is floating and can be put in series with other power supplies as long as the total voltage against ground does not exceed 600 volts. A quick demonstration. The voltage is set to 5 volts on the thumb wheels and that's what the meter on the left shows. The current limit is set to 0.5 amps and all pots are in the cal position so can be ignored. No load is plugged in so no current is flowing in that state only the constant volt light is on. I can change the voltage using the thumb wheel for example to 40.1 volts. When moving the analog volt control out of the cull position, the red warning light comes on. The full range of the analog control is 0 to 10 volts that are added to the value selected by the thumb switch. In this case, bringing the 40.1 volts up to 50 volts or thereabout. The exception is when you're already in the 50 volts or more, then moving from the cull drops you back to 40 volts and you can adjust up to plus 10 volt. That way the output should never exceed 60 volts. Pretty smart how they took care of that, also considering that the original cap on the output was rated for just 60 volts. Still, the maximum selectable output with the thumb switches is 59.9, which is rather close. I'm glad I changed that cap to a 100 volt type. While we're at this, I want to explain the meter, which works quite different from other current meters in power supplies in that it shows percent, not amps. I use a 40 ohm load on 10 volts, so the current is obviously 10 divided by 40 or 0.25 amps. 
the meter on the right shows only 0.238 amps because my resistor isn't exactly 40 ohms, so let's go with that. Because the current limit is set to 0.5, the meter shows that slightly less than half of that current is now flowing. If I increase the current limit gradually to 1 amp, the meter goes down to show that I'm using less and less of the allowed current. I'm using only about 25% of 1 amp. Conversely, reducing the current limit increases the meter reading at 0.3 amp current limit and the meter shows that 0.238 amps represent now 80% of the available current. And of course, lowering the current limit to 0.2 amps, the constant voltage light goes off because the voltage is now only 8.3 volts instead of 10 volts to stay at 0.2 amps. The meter shows that 100% of the allowed current at this setting is flowing. Once you get your head around that the meter is always showing percent of the selected current limit, it is actually quite neat and has the advantage that the resolution follows the current limit. If I now use the current pot, I can add up to 100 milliamps more current and since I'm in the 200 milliamp setting, sure enough, as soon as I get close to the 50 milliamp mark, the constant voltage light comes back on because the allowed current is now 200 milliamps fixed plus about 40 milliamps from the pot. So 240 milliamps, which is slightly more what the load is. You may have also heard a relay click if you missed it I do this transition between constant current and constant voltage a few times. This click is a relay. It switches the front panel lamps between constant current and constant voltage and a second set of contacts is available at the back. More about that in a moment. Interestingly and different from the behavior of the analog walls, if you set the analog current pod into the highest current range of 1 amp, you can actually increase the current limit to up to 1.1 amp. While a maximum of 1.1 amp doesn't sound like a lot, it's good enough for most electronics and the specs are quite impressive in terms of ripple and noise in constant current and constant voltage mode. One of the more unusual features is the already mentioned relay, providing external indication of whether it's in constant current or constant voltage mode. It's the same relay we already heard earlier, one set of contacts driving the indicators on the front and the other set available on the rear panel. This can be useful for unattended operation, alerting you if something strange happened to the device you are powering and killing the power feed to it. The suggested wiring for this is here. At power off, the relay contact rests in constant current mode, but when running and while in constant voltage mode, the contact switches to the shown position and mains flows through the relay contact to run the power supply. As soon as the current limit is triggered, for example by a malfunction of the connected load, the relay contact falls back to constant current, which means the power supply turns itself off, and you can use the contact to power an alarm light or a horn instead. To get the power supply working again, a reset button bridges the relay contacts temporarily. If the problem was fixed, the power supply would go back in constant voltage, closing the relay and you can let go of the reset button. If the problem persists, the power supply remains in constant current mode and turns off as soon as you let go of the reset button. To be clear, the power supply only provides the relay contacts for this to work as I described, it's up to the user to add the external wiring to implement it. Which I have done temporarily here. The current limit is set to 200 milliamps and the voltage is set to 10 volts. A variable resistor set to 100 ohm acts as a load drawing 100 milliamps, which the instrument shows as 50% load. When I lower the resistance, the current increases and at 50 ohms, the current reaches the limit and the power supply turns itself off. I have not rigged a light or audible alert, but if I had, that would be on now. If I increase the resistance back to 10 ohms, I can then press the reset button to get the power supply working again. The relay responsible for this is here, with the protective housing removed. The contacts that drive the lights on the front panel do stick sometimes, with the effect that both constant current and constant voltage lights are on. It does not hamper operation, and I tried cleaning with contact cleaner, but the sticky contact is under the horizontal bar and hard to reach. 
The cleaner helped somewhat, but I may have to take the relay out to clean it properly. Without going too much into details, a quick look at how the power supply managed to regulate 60 volts times 1.1 amps or 66 watts with just one pass transistor. With linear power supplies, the pass transistor basically has to convert the difference in voltage coming from the rectifier to the required output voltage into heat. In this power supply, the rectified voltage is around 70 volts to give some headroom for the regulated max 59.9 volts output. The transistor is most stressed if you need only a tiny voltage, say 3 volts at 1 amp, because it would need to convert 70 volts minus 3 or 67 volts times 1 amp or 67 watts into heat. The trick this power supply uses is to pre-regulate the rectified voltage, so it's always just 10 volts higher than the desired output. In other words, the pass transistor has only to convert 10 volts to heat, regardless what output voltage you select. To do that pre-regulation, they use this SCR, which stands for Silicon Controlled Rectifier, but is nowadays better known as a thyristor. The secondary comparator amplifier is synchronized to the mains waveform through this input and fires the thyristor to keep the voltage at the big capacitor at 10 volts higher than the output. Here the left meter shows the voltage across the big capacitor and the right meter the output voltage. The blue trace shows the sync signal going to the comparator and the yellow trace the trigger pulse for the thyristor. When I change the output voltage setting, the timing of the trigger pulses moves relative to the pulsing DC from the rectifier. By letting only a portion of the rectified wave through, the comparator keeps the capacitor voltage always just 10 volts higher than the output. It's a very neat circuit and may be ahead of its time. Lastly, a quick look at the external programming capabilities. It is called programming, but there isn't anything digital of course. This is the voltage programming, but similar capabilities exist for current. In essence, you can either use an external resistor to control voltage. The higher the resistance, the higher the voltage, and for my model, 12K will give you the maximum 60 volts. It's a linear scale, using 200 ohms per volt. Or you can of course replace the resistor with a programming voltage, but it needs to pass 5 milliamps of current, so a direct connection to a function generator is tricky, depending on the generator's output circuit. This crude circuit here can provide a basic remote on-off capability for about 12 volts output. First job is to remove a link. Doing that disables the front panel voltage selection and then to rig some connection wires. A quick test and indeed the thumb wheel switches are no longer functional. First off, using an external resistor. It works just fine and I can now control the full range of the output voltage. In case you wonder, I did this test before fixing the relay, which is why both lights are on, but the supply is definitely in constant voltage mode. And using the simple transistor circuit shown earlier, driven by a rectangular wave, I can basically turn the output on and off to drive an LED lamp. If I made the circuit smarter to provide a linear resistance change instead, I could produce triangle or other waveforms. As for speed, it depends how high of a voltage swing is needed. Lower voltages can go faster. The spec says 1000 volt hertz, so a 10 volt output could be driven to up to 100 hertz. But in any case, the maximum frequency is 300 hertz. The capability sounds interesting and I may play around with that some more. Another thing I have to defer to another video is an analysis of the capacitors I removed. Lots of more stuff coming up, including interesting devices like this differential voltmeter. If you like my videos, don't forget to subscribe if you not have already and maybe consider becoming a Patreon. That would really help this channel. The link's in the description. As Patreon, you always get early access to videos, a blog and other exclusive content. Thanks for watching.